But then, Lloyd, anyway, I appreciate your time on a Friday afternoon. It's probably the last thing you want to be doing uh, Friday afternoon in the sun as well. So thank you for giving us the time. Well, it's nice to get our actual actual work made, talk about something enjoyable, I guess, <laughs> rather than valves. <laughs> So firstly, uh, congratulations on the, the instructional that come out recently. Um, I've loved it. I've been loving playing around with it in the gym, all the, the uh, false reap and the 50-50 stuff. Thank you. How's it been? What's the, what's, what's the reaction been like from it? Crackers, um, really. You know, I think first and foremost, I think props to Grapple Club. Um, these, you know, these guys are absolute professionals at the craft. You know what I mean? They've got a huge following, but they made the whole process easy for me. It was just, look, you know, turn up and shoot. All I had to do is, is, um, is, is, I guess, deliver techniques. Now, I guess, you know, the fortunate thing, I, I do a lot of teaching anyway, so it comes quite natural to me. Um, but it's been, it's been crackers. Loads of good feedback. But also, you know, these things don't happen on their own. So Grapple Club did a lot to push it. And I've got a lot of friendly people in the community that helped me to push it, you know what I mean? So um, it's been really nice. You know, I don't know, how do you look at barometers? How did that process happen then? I've known like Grapple Club for quite a few years. So Josh, who runs it, he filmed an event in 2014 called Toucan Challenge. I was a purple belt then. So I've met him a few times over the years and I'm so, I'm quite friendly with a lot of the guys in Manchester, like the Progress guys, because I used to live in Manchester um, and, you know, around Stealth. I've trained at Stealth before when I, when I lived and worked, um, lived in Manchester and trained at Factory. So I've always been in, in and around those guys, you know what I mean? And it was just... Um, I think a little bit off the cuff. They were like, oh, actually, we're in, we're in the area, in the north. Do you fancy doing something? So I was like, yeah. Actually, I've got a bag of tricks yeah. I haven't shared yet. Um, and that, I guess, is what you've seen is proper <laughs> leg locks. So is that false reap stuff that you've kind of been developing over the last, like, maybe few months, few years, and it just came at, like, the perfect time for you to put it down yeah, on, on video? Yeah, I've had a lot of questions on, on false reap. So, look, I, I think it's keen to say I did not, coin or develop the initial position um so where where did i see it um i think it was maybe 2018 so the, the first ever place i've ever seen this played was lachlan giles versus oliver tarza at polaris so in the first couple of seconds of that match he tried to hit that now he didn't get it successful but i remember being in the crowd like i was a like, really good position that was it really super interesting um and the thing is with me whenever i've learned or gone down a big theme of developing i I tend to just watch the mi a micro transition and I, and I kept going back on fight pass and I watched that transition over and over and over again. Right. And uh, I was really lucky actually. So Dara O'Connell knows Lackey um, quite well. I think Dara's sister lives in Australia. So he visits Lackey's gym. Um, and I was a bit bummed out because I'd lost on Polaris. But backstage, Dara, he'd seen the same thing as me. He was like, fuck, this is really, really cool position. So he asked Lackey <laughs> to break it down. So Dara was like, you know, redrilling it backstage. So I only saw it that couple of times on the night. And so that's what, three years ago. And I've just been playing it and playing it and playing it ever since. Right. So um, I think um, a little bit of input from Jeremy Skinner, one of the lackeys now black belts came over. Uh, he did a little bit at our gym, but then really I've just spent a lot of time looking at all the different threads and, and positions that come off that. So, mm -hmm. and then, like I said, the key thing I've said in a lot of the marketing material is it's unorthodox. You know, I don't even yeah. think Lackey's put, to be fair, I, I, I suppose I'm guessing, but um, I don't know if this is in, in any of his instructionals yet. You know what I mean? The false reap or, or dedicated to false reap. So, I feel quite proud that I've been able mm -hmm. to get the first resource out there. Um, so, you know what I mean? And it's been, it's pro approximately three years, I guess, of development on my behalf is just getting, um, yeah. getting my head around this. Yeah. No, I'm looking forward to going through some of the finer details when you come and visit us for the, the seminar. This month, definitely definitely yeah, yeah. stuff I didn't share. So you'll be getting a little bit extra as well. For those that um, haven't seen the DVD, there's definitely some extras I'll, I'll throw in there as well. Oh, brilliant. Was you expecting the kind of seminar tour thing to happen as a result of the instruction? No, as I guess as we mentioned at the start of the call, um, I don't have the time, but uh, <laughs> I guess strike while the iron's up, mate. You know what I mean? Um, I'm very conscious, you know, I, I bang on about this all the time and whether it's podcasts or whatever, but a really motivating theme in my head is the concept of memento mori, right? Is re remember you're going to die. Mm -hmm. And, and I always, I always like think, and I don't meditate, but I think on the fact that our time here is finite. You know what I mean? So, if there's an opportunity there, and as long as I've got it within my bandwidth to be able to do it, why not just go after it? So, you know, we're just getting our lives back. I've had a year in lockdown. I've lost 
knocking on for two years of competing now as a result of COVID and stuff like that. Um, and with a seminar tour, I was just like, look, let's just go after it. I could have been doing seminars last year. I'd, I'd not really planned to have a, a tour put together, but I think it's just worked out well. I think releasing the DVD just as people start to get the gyms back open, um, it's worked out pretty well. And, and you know what? It's, it's lovely to see that people don't just buy the the instructional and say, all right, cool, we're happy. People are wanting me to visit the gyms and explore that yeah. further and have the ability to ask questions. So, yeah, it's grown really quick, I think probably all in all i'll be doing about 15 dates which is the most i'll have ever done in a year anyway oh nice nice i know i think uh, when we were having a bit of back and forth messaging i think it's also an opportunity for gyms i know you were saying a lot of gyms are using it as a kind of a thank you to the, the members to definitely keep them open through the last year and that like so if we can put bring someone of your caliber to the gym it, it, it gives a bit of a thank you to the members don't it for supporting us I completely share your ethos. So we've look, we've did the same. So um, Cam brought me to ASW Manchester, um, and I brought Cam in to do some wrestling. So as a thank you, I've got another one or two planned for my guys later in in the year, I guess. But you know what? I think typically a lot of gyms aren't. You know, I mean, it's not like the super legitimate limited companies and stuff like that we support from the government. You know what I mean? So in a lot of instances people in the jiu-jitsu industry have gone without most if not all of their income for last year and it's you know it's entirely on the back of the generosity of the students um that kept these things going so and definitely we we were a small gym so when i moved to goal like what five years ago there was three or four people training we built it up to about 30 odd guys would done this massive expansion into a big unit neil who owns the gym had done a lot of financial outlay Mm -hmm. and then what a year after moving into this massive thing, we've had a year of not being able to grow or um, um, have many students through the doors. It's been a massive risk, but you know there was a, a lot of guys that have kept paying, and I think it says a lot about the ca- the types of people jiu-jitsu attracts um, is the fact that you know we're fortunate in a lot of instances. I've seen not too many gyms go under as a result of uh, student support. Yeah, definitely, and I think I think one of the reasons that I've experienced as well is people realize the importance of what you, and we'll touch on mental health and stuff in a bit like, but people realize the importance of jujitsu and, and other sports as well. But from our experience, jujitsu is massive for people's like coping mechanisms for coping with that stress in life that you was on about before that little bit of escapism where you can, you, you're in the moment on the match. You're not thinking about what's happening tomorrow. You're not thinking about stuff that's happened in the past. That, that, people I've... realize the importance of that, don't they? I got asked a lot of years ago is like, what's the appeal of jiu-jitsu? And that was exactly what I said, is that it is because of the context of fighting and, and you know, playing move for move and defense versus attack and stuff like that, because you're operating in that context, you your focus cannot be any further than the moment. You know what I mean? If, if, if your focus is further than the moment, you're thinking of other things or trying to think too far ahead, you, you no doubt going to have a bad night as a result of it. So, And that is, <laughs> is beautiful. How many times in our life are we truly present with 100% of our attention? You know what I mean? And that's an addictive feeling. Yeah, I think, especially, and I call it, information that there's so much of our lives you know your phone there's so much bombardment of information we're speaking to more people as a as a human race than we ever have done because the, the internet gives us that facil- facility more things are easily attainable so it's actually nice just to have a very simple binary thing that you're going to try and attack me and i'm going to try and attack you and that's all there is to it definitely definitely i agree couldn't agree more do you um you spoke about Memento Mori before. Do you read much Stoicism and that kind of stuff as a philosopher? Yeah, I'm actually quite um, fortunate. My my buddy Finn, um, he paid it forward, as, as they say. He bought me um, the Daily Stoic. So, yeah, I'm working my way through right. that this year. Um, yeah. And I, I guess I probably had a Stoic philosophy without actually reading any of the literature. Now I'm reading these things. I'm like, yeah, you know, what? That, it confirms what I was already thinking and doing. Yeah. So, you know what I mean? And I, I think a lot of stoicism is more than just motivational excerpts from a book. You know what I mean? Um, I think the the life lessons, the way you should approach things and, and how you, in, I think for me, the key is interpretation of events. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm reading a lot is that it's really how you interpret interpret the world that you're seeing is, is, is going to drive um, actually yeah. your experience and journey through that. 
Definitely. I've heard it's been said that um, the, the ability to master any kind of meaning of an event is a superpower. So your life can be miserable, but if you can learn to master meaning of any event that happens to you, that's a superpower in it. You can go through life and anything can happen to you, but your attitude's uplifting. It's good. You see things as positives and take the, the positives away from it because I know serious things do happen, but it is a superpower. <laughs> I tell you, there was a there's a funny story. Um, a couple of jobs ago, I worked in this place and it was super stressful all the time and, and the maintenance manager. And I said to him, I was like, how are you so calm when most of the machines are breaking down on a daily basis? <laughs> he just said to me, he went, um, my demeanour is cool in a crisis, but it's a cover for couldn't care a fuck. <laughs> 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 well, then maybe, maybe there's a, um, a greater philosophy in there, but look, and yeah, I think, definitely. but that, you know, I was running around like a headless chicken at that time and he was probably objectively busier than me. And I'm thinking, wow, this guy's, you know, he's serene. He's swimming at swing, swimming across the water. You know what I mean? Um, and like you say, and it is entirely interpretation of events. And I think there's, that's a, that's a practice. You need to practice that. It's an element that you need to, a skill you need to hone. But yeah. and I think a lot of it comes back to a lack of resilience in modern society is that, we've got such levels of comfort in our life or as a Western society, at least we've removed anything that's challenging, difficult or dangerous to such an extent that when we, whenever we do find anything um, challenging, we tend to fall to pieces or, or it drives our stress levels to such a point that we find it challenging. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, you go and ask the guy who's struggling for food and go, having to go up fishing for three weeks on a little dinghy to feed his family if oh shop shut five minutes before i got there you know what i mean if that's stressful or not you know what i mean is it, it, it it's all yeah. relative isn't it yeah you know i mean what we see as stress or the fact that it might take me 20 minutes extra to get home because i'm in traffic versus the stress of i don't know those next villagers might come or, come along and rob and pillage my village you know what i mean it's, it's yeah, all relative yeah. so yeah. um and i think it's kind of something we should be like Another appeal of jiu-jitsu is that it is uncomfortable when you're on the mats and you're on the bottom of mount, for example. And I think we should be getting in these uncomfortable situations. So when something really bad and serious does happen, we have got a level of resilience, haven't we? Rather than trying to, something serious happens and then we've got to find the resilience to carry on. If you're already doing things that are uncomfortable, I know, um, did you recently just run a marathon for the sake of it? Yeah. To see on your, uh... that, that was the only reason I did it. Look, <laughs> for I... that reason. My body type, I'm what, 5'9 and 85, 86 kilos. You know, I'm small, compact, and yeah, I, gotta, I guess high intensity, short amount of time. Most running I'd ever done, what, once a month? Most I'd ever ran before that last month was what, a 10K? I'd done once. I did one 10K. So then I was like, all right, I'll, um, I think what it was, it was March this year. So at work, we had this thing called a Marchathon, which was who had, who can do the most steps. So me being me outrageously competitive, I'm like, fuck, I'm going to go and try and win this thing for sure. And my job is desk bound. So I knew I'd be at a disadvantage versus the guys that work that are up and down. Yeah. So I did a lot of running. I think I probably ran, you know, from an average of once a week or once a month to, I was doing like between 18 and 20. Now maybe less than that. Call it 10, 15 miles a week for four weeks. In week two, I just decided to do half. I was like, okay, sack it. Let's go and see. Um, yeah. Just one second. Sorry, I've got people instant messaging me, mate. Um, yeah, right. so I decided to do half. I got through that relatively unscathed. And I was like, right, okay. Um, I was on a different podcast and we were talking about this element of like resilience or, or developing resilience. And it's, and I'll say, through um, extreme discomfort. I was like, okay, sack it. I'm, I'm, I promise I'm going to go and do a marathon this year. So I didn't expect to do it two weeks after the fact, whatever it was. But um, there's a kid at work who does a lot of running. And he's like, oh, yeah, it's going to take you six, seven months. There's no way you can go out and do that. You know, you, if you don't run regularly, you're going, to, it's, you're going to cause yourself issues. So you need to build up seven months. It's not, not achievable. I was like, fucking red rag to a ball. I was like, okay you don't understand what kind of a person I am. But but then I thought about it. I was like, look, I've got a decent level of cardiovascular fitness. What's the worst that that's going to happen? Yes, I could develop some muscular injuries, um, but it's mainly going to be this. Can I tolerate the level of pain and suffering? That's it. 
Yeah. So and literally, I wanted to just go and do it just because I wanted to get into some very deep suffering because we've had such a comfortable year, sat at home, not training, eating takeaways three nights a week, drinking beer every oh. night, being fat. And I just wanted to punish myself and get myself out there. But and I always talk about a concept of opening doors in my in your head, you know, and and I think when you've opened this new level or this new door, it's like you fill up your confidence meter, you fill up your resilience meter, you know what I mean? And it just gives you a greater understanding of life of what you're capable of. Like yeah. I've always thought, fucking hell, why would anyone do a marathon? That looks completely un- unobtainable. Now I know in my head, now if I had to go out and grunt it out, I could do that. With, you know, with no training, get it done. Yeah. And the interesting thing with a marathon, I was running and, uh, and I was hitting like what? I think I was doing that. I, I set out with the aim of doing nine minute miles for, for as long as I could. I got to mile 19. I'm like, this is fucking easy. Honestly, <laughs> I couldn't but, believe it. I couldn't believe it. I was like, this is so easy. I'm breezing it. Nine, six miles to go. I've got 10K to go. I can't believe how well I'm doing. This is great. <laughs> got into mile 20. I remember looking. Yeah. <laughs> and everyone, loads of people said to me, you're going to hit the wall. You're going to hit the wall. And I got to like mile 20 and a half. And literally the wall for me was my legs just went from feeling okay to mm-hmm. extreme pain, uh, cramp, couldn't move them. <laughs> so I was, I, I was, I was running in really weird because my legs had jacked up. I was trying to put calories in aggressively. And the last, I guess the last two miles, my legs were so bad. I was having to like overcompensate with my arms just to try and build up momentum to keep going. Um, so yeah, it was rough. And then the thing is I'd, mis- I'd miscalculated my finish point. So I, I had to do another quarter of a mile. So I pulled up, my missus was outside in the car and I had to run around a cemetery car park for about six loops just oh to get my, my extra quarter mile in. So <laughs> yeah, I think back to the original point um, is development of resilience in modern society is, is key and you've got to go and do horrid shit to try and figure that out and like i said jiu-jitsu is a great way of doing that and when we don't have jiu-jitsu that's why i did dumb stuff like um a marathon but not enough people um you know and that's why maybe maybe there's a prevalence of adverse mental health at the moment because not enough people are challenging themselves to a position where you're operating beyond your level, of your perceived limits, let's say. Yeah, definitely. No, I agree. So was there anything else stupid that you kind of wanted to go go and do during lockdown because you couldn't do any jiu-jitsu? Well, uh, another one was uh, skydiving. I don't know if you saw that. So all my life I've gone, why would anyone jump out of a working plane for any reason other than you're a military badass and you fight going into war, right? Why would you do that? You're an absolute idiot. Um, so, and I, and I think it, I've, it's, I've always been apprehensive about it. So I don't mind heights. I've always had a little bit of fear about flying because I'm thinking, and the reason being, I think I'm m- myself a little bit of a control freak, control freak. I want to be able to influence everything around me. Fundamentally, you got on a plane. If that starts to go down, you're done. So there's always an apprehension when it comes to flying. You're trusting into the plane, you're trusting into the pilot. So then the, I guess, logical extreme point of that is let's go up in a plane and jump out of it. Let's see what happens. You know what I mean? Um, So that was one. My missus bought it me for Christmas uh, because I've said for years, like, look, I don't want to do it. It's a dumb idea. So she bought it me at Christmas. So when I got that done as well, and that one was a major one, that was such a good experience because felt fine all the day all day but the drastic increase in fear when the plane's at altitude you're shuffling forward and the door opens that as an adult it's not you know if you think back to your childhood you felt really scared when you're watching like something scary on tv but objectively as an adult how many times can you say you felt extreme palpable fear about anything for your life you know what i mean unless somebody's chased you with a knife it probably not if ever so you know this the the extreme level of fear shuffling towards that door and you think fucking you know, hell what are you doing here what, what are you, you doing that step through that door then what is it that makes you take that step through the door the bloke pushing you off <laughs> the competition with yourself or um, <laughs> yeah it's competition it, it, it's beating down something telling you not, to not do that i think and like I say, is the fear you feel right up to the point. And then when you free fall and it flips from being extremely fearful to just a such a crazy, int- intense adrenaline driven experience. You know what I mean? It was 
but like I say, that to me is like a superpower in itself is the, the ability to feel very adverse feelings and push through them, get a job done. That's, that's addictive in itself. You know what I mean? And, and, and skydiving just to me just feels like you're on turbo mode because the, the level of adrenaline dump you're getting from that. Like as I, as I pulled the shoe, I felt sick to my stomach because you'd gone from a big high to right relaxing now. So yeah, I, I, to be blunt, I was shit scared of skydiving and I was, I'm very happy to have ticked that off. I mean, just talking to you now, I can tell that um, you've got that competitive edge about you, whether that's just with yourself personally, you can always competing with yourself to push yourself to new limits and that. Are you looking forward to competing again, jujitsu wise as yeah. the competition starts? I've thought a lot about this yeah. now. Weirdly, I'm a lot. I'm 33 now. I've got two kids. I've got a, uh, you know, a busy corporate professional life. It could be forgiven for saying, actually, you know, I'm done now. I've got a coach in the gym. I'm going to take it easy a little bit and, uh, you know what I mean, not compete as much. But for me personally, it's it's how I define myself. Being competitive and everything it is, is part of my core identity and, and not having the ability to push myself into an environment where I can win or where I can lose. I think I need that as part of my identity, but also my happiness. And that's why I've done the stupid mm -hmm. stuff like skydiving um, or, you know, running a marathon because I need something to benchmark myself. I call it calibration. You know, if you, yeah, I don't like the feeling of drifting aimlessly off into, you know, thinking I'm good at something and then never having an opportunity to calibrate whether I actually, my perception is a drift of reality. Competition, you know, keeps those two things um, together. If you get absolutely spanked in competition, you know, your perception of yourself will drop off with your actual level. You know what I mean? Whereas if you never yeah. compete and, you know, you see fake black belts and they're smashing the students about and the students are all brainwashed by them, their perception is here, the reality is here. So they're allowing yeah, this, this yeah. gap to grow. And my, my happiness resides in those two being one and the same is that I am mm -hmm. as good as, as um, you know, sorry, I am testing how good I am and know it, knowing that whether that's good and bad. I mean, these, it's not a linear relationship. These things ebb and flow. Um, but yeah. I, th I think competition is for as long as I'm able, I think I, I'm going to be doing it now. I do need to make some different changes. So the last three years, I pushed really hard so to do a lot of pro, pro, I call it pro, but you know what I mean? Like super fights and Polaris and grapple fest. Yeah, like grapple like fest, Polaris, all yeah. Um, I've tried to do a lot of those. Now, if I'm going to do anything like that again, I like the format. I, I'm thinking it's more, I need to be probably selective. I do have to realize I have got a, a lot on. So I'm, I'm probably just going to accept masters matches only, you know, as much as because I'm a leg locker, people are like, oh, you know, when you want to fight this kid who's 24, lives in the gym, has no responsibilities. Um, it's funny, like somebody's like, oh, why don't you fight this guy? He wants to fight. I was, and I, I just joked. I went, you uh, work my job for the next month and watch my two kids for the next <laughs> month as well. And we'll talk about it now. Yeah. And. And I guess, and, I, and I've, the dilemma I've had with myself is, am I, am I copping out? Should I be taking the most difficult journeys and stuff like that? But I just can't keep myself at the same level that I was three years ago. You know what I mean? I was training three years ago, seven days a week, every week. Now I'm down to like four now, you know what I mean? And it's maybe an hour and a half rather than three hours a day and things like that. So you, I think you, your decision making has got to move with the reality again of what your existence is. So yeah, I'm definitely going to compete. I'm keen to get back in. I'm trying to have a, you know, the, you'll see the videos. I'm trying to have a tussle with the, the young guns in the gym now. Yeah. Um, it's just finding the time for it and being selective, I guess. So I'm, I'm maybe thinking about doing an IBJF mm -hmm. um, uh, adult. Now I can uh, heel hook, but it's definitely sub submission only yeah, yeah. is where my passion is. Yeah, yeah. Um, just to get your take on it, it'd be interesting to find out your thoughts on you speaking about like as an athlete. Um, looking to go masters and understanding that your limitations with your lifestyle and the, the responsibilities you've got compared to a 21 year old who lives in the gym. Um, for the hobbyists about who just attend the gym two or three times a week, I'd like to hear your thoughts on, because in the gym, you'll get people who compare themselves to other people within that gym. And there'll be young lads who have no responsibilities who are in college, but can train every day of the week. You'll have, I don't know, maybe people like myself, 40 years of age, um, you just want to keep fit, do it two, three times a week, but they might have, you have higher ranks, lower ranks, but you're constantly comparing yourself to other people in the gym. I'd love to get your take on, on that kind of thought process. 
Yeah, every now and again I get I don't get on a ramp, but I, I have to I guess give a few lessons here and there and that. And what you know, one I wheel out every couple of months is you've got to set the context for what your success in a round should be. Every single round you roll based on who you are and who they mm-hmm. are. You know what I mean? Like I've got guys who are 45, probably, you know, a little bit higher uh, weight than their optimal work permanent night shifts. And then yeah. I've got six foot three, 120 kilo, pure muscle athletes that I've done, you know, athletic endeavors in other sports before. And the problem, and the problem is with jujitsu, it's a sport based on a final outcome. You know what I mean? Submission. Yeah. You know, we're rammed down. Everything's about the submission, be, you know, be the submission. So everyone has that as their barometer for success. So, you know, Dave, your night shift worker who trains twice a week, isn't in the greatest shape and he gets absolutely ragged by Stefan, the, you know, athlete, 120 kilos on juice. And so he gets frustrated about the fact that he's not winning and stuff like that. You know what I mean? And really his barometer for success should be, I'm going to go with this Uber monster and I just want to shut his game down and survive. That's it. You know, if that means me being under yeah. side control, not getting submitted, that's a win. You know what I mean? So yeah, you, you need to shift that. And But on the inverse as well, I get frustrated with some of the good competitive guys when they're taking the piss out of hobbyists. Do you know what I mean? And they're absolutely busting them up with submissions. I'm like, you, you are gaining nothing, but you are fundamentally destroying a training partner's, um, yeah. a training partner's confidence. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know what I mean? And like to the competitive guys, I'm like, look, you should use the roles where you, you, your chance of success is so high. Do your developmental work, do live drilling. You know, I'll be like, right, if you hit a move, keep going to guard, keep hitting that move. Don't make it obvious that's what you're doing, but guide the role there. You know what I mean? So, and, I, and I'm very keen on at least having in more open roles rather than specific training or comp training. I'm always like, look, have a, have a plan what you need to hit. Because that's how we get better is is that, right, it's, jiu-jitsu is about drilling with the context. So I'm not a major fan of cold drilling, repping, 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 because yeah. for me, what you know, what variables have you got to consider to execute a move? You've got your strength, the other guy's strength, your technical proficiency, how tired you are, how much they're resisting. Mm-hmm. So cold reps are great, but they're only improving the technical element of it. They're not accounting for the fact whether you're tired or he's tired. And they're not accounting for the fact yeah. whether I'm using strength or he's using strength. So for me, I think cold drilling is great for you to get the basics down of that move. But then you need to move into either specific training from a position or yeah. when you're free rolling is have a, a, a move in mind that you need to try and hit a couple of times. That's that's king for skill development, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. So. That's something yeah. that we promote the uh, positional sparring quite a lot in the gym. Like, yeah, yeah. Just keeping it dead specific to a certain position, reset once you've passed or tapped and go back and do it that way. Yeah. I've even gone more so in that direction. So we've always done bits of it. And I've, probably, and I've since we've come back, I now do, so we stick it to a theme for a week or two, but then we'll warm up with specific spar. So, you know, we've, we're doing back control. So we'll do warm up. Then it'll be like, right. Okay. You're going to do two twos with different partners. Um, back versus escapes okay but like to be clear up front i'll just do no submissions and then we'll do all the the technique work and then we'll, then we'll do it again specific training um uh, with the submissions in so people are getting you know, it's called is it diegetic knowledge but it's specific contextual knowledge of right. attacking for the back you know what i mean whereas if you just allow them to roll after you've drilled there's not they've not got no knowledge of being on the back attacking when the guy's resisting so i'm yeah, huge, mean, huge yeah. on that yeah, yeah. So how do you incorporate the kind of leg locks then with that specific training? Do you, would you start in a, a 50-50 position and one person escape, one person attack? How do you incorporate that? Like, yeah, it probably sounds quite extreme, but for a lot of the more advanced guys, like we will lock in, fully locked in heel hooks and from whatever position. So it, again, I suppose there's different points to it. From a defensive point of view, we will start in fully locked in heel hooks. I've got my hands gripped up, ready to go, and I'm... I'm two seconds away from finishing right sparring versus escape go that's how you develop your confidence your escaping game then we'll do like specific rounds so i've not got the heel but i've got you in fully locked in saddle 50 50 whatever and i've got good knee control um or 
then we'll just do rounds where I'm in yeah. the prelude to the leg lock position, so where I can hit my setup. You know what I mean? It's the three chunked pieces. So going back to a uh, competition, um, you just predominantly is it just no with all your time constraints and that? Like you're not, you don't mix it up. Gear no gear. Is it pretty much no for you for the time being? I think, yeah, um, like a big aspiration of mine for years and years and years was the Euros and I won Master 1 brown belt. Um, and kind of I'd started to realise already in 2017 that like time is an issue. Um, you know what I mean? I've still, I mean, it's never been an option for me to want to jump in full time on being just a jiu-jitsu guy. I've always wanted to keep both options open, my career and jiu-jitsu. Um, and then I realised a hindrance was trying to focus on the two codes as much as my game was pretty similar in both, you know what I mean? I had more sleeve grips, but I was still playing like K-guard entries, going for the legs, yeah. toes and stuff. They were very similar. I definitely saw it as a limiting factor. I absolutely love the gi. I think it's great. Um, you know, I have a lot of passion for the gi, but I'm just committing to being much better at no gi. Um, I guess I'm, I prefer that slightly more, but yeah, it's, it's a time, it's, a, it's an allocation yeah. of time. I'm down to like four days a week now, so if I'm going to retain any level of greatness in no gi, it's got to be focused hundred percent on that. So uh, to the point I've pulled it, I've put my gi on once in a year and oh, I don't yeah. even think I rolled it just to promote somebody. So uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm ne never say never. I think maybe in years to come, I'll put it back on, but for the time, for the foreseeable future, I've got no intention of even training or competing in the gi. Yeah, yeah. I know there's, um, there's a lot of like kind of debate at the moment. I, I don't know if you've seen like some of the Joe Rogan and John Danaher conversations with Gordon Ryan and that, where they're, they're literally talking that like the two sports are just yeah, separating. Sure. Those, yeah, people won't mix in both. They'll just do one or the other. Yeah. What are just, your thoughts on that, like? You know, when you the, the major turn off for me when you, we got super heavy into lapel guard and stuff like that. Now, and, and you know, and I'll get a lot of heat for this because there's people who buzz off lapel gardens, you know, because there's so much depth context to yeah. it that you can learn. But it's so prohibitive to movement and transition that I just like, oh, this is just a, uh, it's, it's a turn off for me because the exciting, you know, the exciting bit of matches we watch is, is in the fractions between positions where people are scrambling. You know what I mean? That's where it's yeah. all won or lost. You know, the times in we're watching in the pyramid when, you know what I mean? Uh, best one I ever saw. When Rafa got the armbar on Cobrinha, I can't remember what worlds it was, but Cobrinha was like defending the pass they were, and they were, he was standing up and then Rafa scrambled yeah. through the armbar and, and armbarred the life out of him. That was that was in a scramble. <laughs> now, a lot of the modern positions with respect to like lapel guard and stuff are prohibitive towards movement. So that's why I was like, as much as it's technically, you know, really good and in depth and there's a lot of good stuff you can do off it, it makes any sort of transition from A to B much more difficult. And I think probably that lends itself to points games much more because you, you prevent in a pass, you're, you know, so you, you're restricting your opponent's movement. So their ability to pass is much, much diminished, which decreases the risk of you losing that match. So if you can get a sweep yeah. or you can score, you, you, you've got a higher chance of winning. So, that was a definitely a bit of a turn off for me. So just that kind of game, I, 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 like I said, it was more of a time based decision, but I think some of the newer trends in Guy a little bit turned me off as well. Yeah. 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 I must admit like I, I am predominantly more Guy than no Guy, but I would much more enjoy watching a no Guy sub grappling event than the, the world's, you know what I mean? It's much more kind of audience friendly, I think. Norgi submission grappling. That's why we've, we've been to a few of the Grapple Fest. We've seen you compete a few times at Grapple Fest. Um, an amazing promotion and it's just exciting. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you've hit an interesting point because I think Gi is equally as fun to do, but yeah. it is not as fun to watch. Now, yeah, again, and again, I think the, it, yeah. <laughs> the, the reasons I, get, I gave before, and, it, and it's the transitions which are exciting to watch in no gi, you know, when, when somebody's doing something to somebody else and they're getting, you know, moves off and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what's exciting to watch. Now, if we want the sport to grow and become more mainstream, you know, which, which it is doing, but as you see, what are all the pro events now? It's no gi, it's Gordon Ryan, it's Craig Jones, you know what I mean? Um, even yeah. like I said, Michael Musumeci, he's he's just done his uh, first no gi yeah, match. Did really last last event last weekend, didn't it? Yeah, 
So, yeah. and I think it's probably that Nogi is more palatable to a, you know what, I'll go even go as far as it is more palatable to jiu-jitsu audiences. Because like you said, I know it's harsh to say, I used to watch the world and I'd fall asleep as much as it, there'd be some great matches yeah. on it because it's slow, slow. And you're trying to wait for a, you know, I think I looked at a metric once and it was like number of major scoring transitions in black belt level world championships. And it's like, or the average point scored is between two and three. So that means it's either a sweep or a pass. One transition in 10 minutes. You know what I mean? So therefore, you're seeing one transition, which takes on average, what, five seconds, let's say, to execute in a 10-minute match. You, so you're having one exciting thing in 10 minutes. It's hard, it's hard to be engaged with that for so long. I know, I know. Speaking of a um, Nogi competition, I'm going to apologise because the date we booked the seminar with yourself, I think the 17th of June, it's the same night as the Polaris team event, UK and uh, oh, USA. Right, okay. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm that not on that anyway. Leg, so, so laugh watching on catch up. <laughs> but not, that'll be quite an exciting event. I've, I've just been looking at the lineup on that, and you mentioned Daro O'Connell before, and uh, yeah, he's got a good good team behind him. So I look up a lot to Daro. So he's a very similar weight. Well, he was similar weight to me. I was lost a lot of weight recently. Similar similar age, similar build. Um, so I've definitely looked up to. Him. I trained at Daro's gym quite a few years ago when I was a purple belt. Um, but that's also a fight I'd like to have um, with Daro. I think his, his style versus mine would match up well. Um, but yeah, I think Daro's a great a great leader for the team. And actually, it's really, really strong. You know, Bradley Hill always seems to do well. Um, he's he's very tough to put away. I don't think I, something like I don't think he's been submitted at black belt level. Maybe some crazy thing oh, like that. Wow. Um, yeah. It's a good team, but that USA team's just crazy. It's a strong team, as well, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. JT Torres, man, he's he's the for me, he's the king of ADCC rules. He's just such a slickster. So that'll translate well to a yeah. Nogi team event. Yeah. I so. Think, uh, one of the last people to come in the USA team was one of the Rotolo twins as well. And they've been uh, doing really good things, haven't they, on the, the circuit recently? They're going to dominate the sport for years to come. The Rotolo twins, are just, they're just so good, so slick. Just seeing what they do to time serve black belts and the, what, 17, 18, it's just unbelievable. I know, it's mad, isn't it? I know, I know. Makes me sick. <laughs> so one last <laughs> I appreciate your time anyway, Lloyd, uh, this Friday afternoon, all we only said about 45 minutes. Later. But one thing before we go, what is an acceptable length of shorts for a man to wear? <laughs> if it stretches longer than your hands, it's too long. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Where does that whole thing stem from then? Is that like a, an inside joke that you... No. Um, <laughs> I've wore short shorts for years. So I, to, I guess <laughs> you, a man being from uh, Wigan way, um, you'll know the rugby league shorts are always pretty short. Yeah, well, so. I'm actually from uh, I'm actually from St. Helens. Ah, okay. Based in league. I'm from St. Helens, like, but yeah, still rugby league, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So I used to get a lot of um, Aussie rugby league shorts. So NRL, um, yeah. I've got like Manly Sea Eagles, um, the tiny, tiny shorts, Chiefs right. and stuff like that. Yeah, I've got. They're all pretty short, but I just find them much more comfortable and appealing than you know, 17 inch wide and 25 inch long shorts that are down to your knees. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> like. Well, when I used to wear longer shorts, I'd always find myself when I'm doing nogi, like pull, oop, pulling my shorts up. You know what I mean? So yeah, um, and I just I think probably not to keep this. Com- not, I would just say this in a politically correct fashion. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Don't in worry. a bit of a masculine, no no homo way, but it, it looks much more manly. You know what I mean? Getting your your quads out, showing what you've worked yeah, for yeah. and stuff like that. So yeah, I just think it looks cool, man. I can't. <laughs> You know, having uber long shorts just, just doesn't look right to me. So yeah. um, I'm trying to start a bit of a movement, team short shorts. It's good because, it, like I said, I joke around. I've got regional directors. There's like, you know, people in Ireland, guys in Finland rocking short shorts. Um, yeah, it's good to see yeah. that it's catching on and people are, are keeping that ethos. So um, I'm pushing <laughs> Scramble to make some proper short shorts for me. I'm really pushing them. All right. Nice. Well, we'll see how many people turn up on a... Uh... The seventeenth in uh, short shorts. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone gets a high five from me who's got short shorts on. Put it that way, do, do it. <laughs> well, thanks a lot, mate. Anyway, I appreciate your time, and I look forward to the seminar on the seventeenth of June. 
Yeah, no, thank you. I'm really, really excited. So, um, just as a reminder to your guys, I'm happy for him to film it. The only thing I ever asked is don't put it on the internet, obviously, because it might prevent me from getting future seminars. Um, I also do Q&A as well, which is not re- just specifically related to what I teach. So, if, they, uh, if they've got any questions about anything in leg locks, encourage them to have a think beforehand. I will do, mate. No worries. Thanks again. Look forward to it. Yeah, see you soon, buddy. All the best. All right, take care, mate. Thank you.